Good morning, everyone. I hope you're finding this heat not too daunting. Uh, last weekend, I was visiting some old friends up in Stockton on Tees, and uh, I, I attended a, a, an Anglican church, which was which was very lively. And uh, in fact, it was a church that the explorer James Kirk, or not James Kirk, I'm thinking of Star Wars or, or Star, Trek. Star Trek, yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, uh, James Cook, he attended. And in, in this actual church, there is a communion table that was made out of the wood of the ship, the Endeavor. Very interesting. And at the end of the service, I don't suppose we can do this now, because it was hot and, and, and clammy, we had ice cream. They served free ice cream. If we had thought about that, maybe we could have done that as well, Chris. So probably too late to organize that. Um, but it was very nice and very refreshing. And it was nice to be in a good, solid Anglican church. There are some really good ones out there. And uh, I was blessed to be there. We're continuing to look at um, Mark's gospel, and um, I'm going to refer to a passage th that I have referred to in times past, but I've never preached on. So if you have your Bible, we're looking at Mark chapter 12, Mark chapter 12. And I do have my watch in front of me there, and of course I am depending on my timekeeper as well if I should exceed a certain amount of time. Um, Mark chapter 12, and we're reading at verse 28. Mark chapter 12, verse 28. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them deba debating, noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer. He, he asked them, of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Well said, teacher. The man replied, you were right in saying that God is one and there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding and with all your strength and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the, from the kingdom of God. And from then on, no one dared ask him any more questions. God's blessing be upon his word this morning. Um, I was a child of the 60s. By that, I don't mean that I was born in the 60s. I, I wish I was, but... <laughs> Uh, I was familiar with the music of the 60s, and obviously in the 60s it was, the big thing was the Beatles. And there was one song especially uh, that I, I always took a shine to, and don't worry, I won't, I won't sing it to you unless you want me to, you know. Uh, but it was, uh, all you need is love. Love. Love is all you need. In fact, in the 60s, the Beatles seemed to have one hit after another. But that one comes to mind this morning. All you need is love. And uh, you'll probably remember that more than anything else from my sermon this morning. But I would say that, that in the Christian life, all you need is love. Love. Love is all you need. And here in this passage of Scripture that I've read to you this morning, we have what is known as the, as the great commandment. Jesus is asked the question, and Jesus says, well, this is the greatest commandment. In actual fact, he says two things. He talks about love, a, a vertical love to God, and then a horizontal love to man. 
And I suppose that's a good mission statement for any church, isn't it, really? Love God and love people. And here Jesus, he says, this is the greatest commandment, love God and love people, a, a uh, vertical love to God and a horizontal love uh, to man. And so here, Jesus is engaged in a conversation with a, uh, a man, one of the teachers of the law, and uh, it's just interesting for us to eavesdrop, to hear this conversation that took place, because the great commandment is in the context of this conversation that Jesus has with a scribe. So just a few simple thoughts, just following the passage of Scripture. Uh, I, I want to look at the question that is asked. Well, the question that is asked is very simply this. He comes to Jesus. What's the greatest commandment? I, um, I don't know if you ever watch Question Time, BBC. I've, I've never been asked to go on it for some reason. I don't know why. They don't realize what they're missing not having me on Question Time. Uh, but but I, I thinking about this, I think Mark chapter 11 and, and, and Mark chapter 12, in, in my notes I put down, they are question time chapters. The religious leaders of the day were trying to trap Jesus. They were trying to get the people to turn against Jesus. And so they come to him and they ask him various questions. They ask him questions on authority in Mark chapter 11. By what authority are you doing these things? And then somebody else came to him uh, and asked him a question about taxes. Should we pay our taxes? To, is, is it right and lawful? Well, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but we have to pay our taxes, I'm afraid. Hey, and I, I've had some tremendously good news from the taxman. I had a tax rebate the other day. Isn't that wonderful? Aren't you, aren't you happy for me? No, most of you is okay. Yay, I had a tax rebate. Rather than the taxman taking money off me, he gave me some money uh, because I hadn't paid enough tax. So, and then, and then he's asked a question on the on the on the resurrection. The Sadducees who don't believe in the resurrection. This guy tells a story uh, about a woman who had seven husbands, and they all died. Now, the question I would be asking is, why did that woman have seven husbands? All right. Uh, it's a bit suspicious, isn't it? But sh they, they ask a question about the resurrection. And, and, and this is the reason why the Sadducees are sad, you see, because they didn't believe in the resurrection. Do you like that one? That's why they were sad, you see. Yeah. But then this one other man, and there is sincerity, I believe, in the question that he's asking here. Now, what is the greatest commandment? And uh, maybe he was hoping to trip up Jesus, but I, somehow I don't think so. I think there was sincerity in the question that he was asking. Uh, and if he was to say something that was opposed to Moses, ah, then we've got him. Because they thought very highly of Moses. He was as it were, their number one hero, Moses, for a Jew, Moses, he's the man. If we can get him to say something contrary to Moses, we've got him. But having said that, I believe there was sincerity in this man's question. What is the greatest commandment? Now, he was a scholar. And... Scholars tell us, those who have studied the Torah, which is the first five books of the Bible, that there were 613 different commands. Now, you might say to yourself, well, I struggle with 10, and <laughs> sometimes I do as well. But there were 613 different commands in the Torah. And he was asked, what is the greatest? And, and 248 of those commands were positive, things that you should do, and 365 were negative things, things that you shouldn't do. So there you are, 613, and Jesus is asked, what's the greatest? What's the top of the pops? 
and I, 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 I just love this, really. If you, were, if you were running from your burning home, what important things would you take with you, apart from your, your children or your husband, or at least I hope you take your husband? Your, uh, but apart from that, what, what would you take? What important items would you take? If there were 613 laws all laid out on a long table here, that stretches from one wall to another wall, what, what would be the one you choose? The question that he asked. Hey, I'll just throw this in in passing. God never gave us the law in order that we could be saved by the law. Aren't you glad about that? Is there anybody here who actually thinks that they could keep all of the law? perfectly? I am so glad. Paul in Galatians says that the law was, as it were, like a, a school teacher to lead us to Christ, to show us how much we needed Jesus, because in ourselves we are just not able to keep the law. So here is the question that is asked, what is the greatest commandment? Now we've got to come, obviously, to the answer that Jesus gave, and this is what Jesus says. The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Now, if I was to define what a Christian is, for me, that's what a Christian is. It's warm when you stand here, isn't it? A lot of heat coming out of this here, you know. No wonder you're feeling this, the heat. <laughs> but to me, that is what a Christian is. Love God. Love people. I, I love this story. I heard this story. Uh, this businessman, uh, he had to go on a very important business, business trip, and he needed his, his suit to look nice, so he, he was thinking about a dry cleaner. I need to get this done, and I need to get it done as, as soon as possible. And, and he thought about a, a particular shop he saw, one hour dry cleaning, one hour cleaning. He said, I'll take it there. So he took the suit to this, this cleaner, and uh, the man took his name, and etc. cetera. And, and then the man said, right. I'll, I'll be back. I'll be back in two hours to collect my, my suit. And the man said, "Oh no, I'm sorry. It won't be ready until Thursday." But he says, "You got outside your your door one hour cleaning." Oh yeah, that's that's what we call ourselves, but it's not what we do. <laughs> and we call ourselves Christians. But what we do needs to correspond with what we call ourselves. Agreed? We're Christians, but what we do has to correspond with what we say we are. And here Jesus says, actually he was only asked what is the greatest, but Jesus gives him a twofold answer, doesn't he? He answers it by saying two things. He says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. So love God. In the Jewish faith, this is known as the, the Shema, S-H-E-M-A, from the Hebrew word here. See, you're getting educated here, aren't you? Well, I look at him. My son, he reads his Hebrew Bible most mornings, I think. So, actually, I've gone to him for help from time to time uh, in connection with different Hebrew things. But that's, that's, a, that's another story. Uh, Shema. The, the he and for an Orthodox Jew, they repeat that twice daily. Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one God. I, I just a couple of months ago, I was walking in the Pennine Way with a, with a, a, a friend, and tucked away in this valley. Uh, the first ten miles, incidentally, was wonderful. The the last five or six miles was absolute agony. But never mind. Uh, but as we were walking in this little valley, I saw some Jewish people. It was it was obvious that they were they they were Jewish the way they were dressed, etc. And I remember I yelled down to them in the valley, "Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God." is 
is one God. And they said something back to me, and I'm not quite certain what it was. But we, we managed to get speaking to these people afterwards, and we had a great conversation with them. I'm inclined to do things like that. I don't know why. I was walking into town the other day, and this guy had a Star War shirt on. And as he was approaching me, I said, the force be with you. And he kind of looked at me as if I was some creature out of, out of Star Wars. But hey, that's, that's, that's something else, all right? But it's the Shammah. Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one. Now we sang about it. He has no equal. The Lord our God is one God. Incidentally, in the, in the Hebrew, that is a compound unity. It is a unity that means it consists of more than one. So even there in the Old Testament, I think we've got uh, an indication of the trinity of God. He has no equals. And that's why we love God, because there's nobody like our God. He's our creator. He's the one who gives us life and breath and being. Nobody like our God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is... Why, why do you love certain people? I, I won't embarrass anybody saying, why do you love a such and such a person, your spouse? Probably for most of you, you should say, well, we just love them because of who they are. And we, we love God because of who he is. So that's why we love. And how are we to love? Well, Jesus says you've got to put everything into it. You love him with all your heart, your soul, your mind, with all your strength. An interesting uh, commentator, William Barclay, he, he talks about how we, how we are to love God Loving God d directs our thoughts. We love him with our, th our thought. We, it, it dominates our emotions. We love God with all our heart. And it's, it's the dynamo behind our, behind our actions. Now, if, if, if you remember to say to your wife, you know, you know, I love you with all my heart. I love you with that organ that is pumping within me. They probably look at you and say, well, that's not what it means. It means that you love them with your emotion. Just imagine if we, if we replace the word, because what is the heart? It's effectively a pump, isn't it? Uh, um, imagine Tony Bennett singing, I left my pump in San Francisco. Or, imagine that. Or Scylla Black, anyone who had a pump. You know, you, we, might, we all know these songs. No, it means that we love God with all our emotion, with our intellect as well. You don't set aside your intellect when you become a Christian, by the way. We love God with our intellect, with our emotions, with our strength, with, with everything that we have. We love God. So what is the greatest commandment? Love God because of who he is. And that's how we should love God, with, with, every, with every fiber of our being. And then, and then he says this. Incidentally, that, that is a quote from uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5. And then, and then Jesus says, and the second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. And that is a quote from Leviticus 19, verse 18. Love your neighbor as these. Love God, love people. That's what a Christian is. Loving God, loving people. Some people are hard to love, aren't they? I'm trying not to look at anybody as I say that. But, <laughs> but I mean, some people, it's real, it's real hard work, isn't it? Come on. You know, you know what I'm saying is true. You know what makes sense, as Del Boy used to say. Yeah. And then he says, I should love yourself. So... The same self-care that you would give to yourself is how you are to love people.
And that's not always easy. And you might say, well, well, who is, who is my neighbor? Jesus was asked that question on, on one occasion. Well, who is my neighbor? And, 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 and Jesus says, your neighbor is anybody, but your neighbor especially could be your enemy, according to Luke chapter 10 in the parable that Jesus gave of the Good Samaritan. Who is my neighbor? It's anyone. It's not just the people who live next door to you or above you or below you. It's anybody. And that's how we are to love. Hey, as a church, we need to love people. Love God, love people. Incidentally, I, th I think that these two commandments are closely related to one another because I think uh, you, you can't love people if you don't love God. And In fact, if you go to John's little epistle, he talks about uh, how can we say that we love God, but yet we don't love our, our brother who's, who we can see? How can we say that we love God whom we cannot see, but we can't get on with the brother that we can see? So they're closely related to one another. And in the parallel passage of this, in Matthew chapter 22, Jesus says, these two commandments, on these hang the law, all of the law and all of the prophets, on those two commands. So they're closely related to one another. And incidentally, in, in those commandments, if you, if you love God, just taking the Ten Commandments as our guideline, if you love God, then you will have no other God before you. You won't take his name in vain. So that's loving God. And then if you love people, then what will you do? You'll not commit adultery with somebody's spouse. You won't lie. You won't murder them. You certainly wouldn't murder somebody if you, if you love them, would you? But you can see how it works out. So the question, what, what is the greatest commandment? And then the answer, we're going on quickly here. And, and look, at the, look at the response here. Look at the affirmation. Well said, teacher, the man replied. You are right in saying that God is one and there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all the burnt offerings. Now, just remember, they're probably in the precinct of the uh the temple here, um, offerings are probably going on. And, and here's this scribe who was a teacher of the law, who knew the Torah, probably inside out. He gives Jesus a, th a thumbs up and he says, mm, good job. So Jesus gets encouragement from this scribe. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And I suppose... It's always encouraging when a speaker gets a thumbs up rather than a thumbs down from time to time. But Jesus got a thumbs up. He says, you're right. Loving God, loving people, more important than anything else, more important than the burnt offerings. Because even the burnt offerings in the Old Testament, God said they had to be given in a spirit of love and gratitude to God. In fact, there's a verse of Scripture that, that says that um, obedience is better than sacrifice. Better than the sacrificing of animals is obedience. Last point. The question, the answer, the affirmation, and then... Jesus gave a, an observation here. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said, you're not far from the kingdom of God. And from then on, nobody asked him any more questions. You're not, you're not far from the kingdom of God, but yet he wasn't in the kingdom of God. There was something about his reply that Jesus liked. Maybe he saw in his reply a, a, a desire uh, to fully obey God and, and to love God with all his heart and soul. Maybe, maybe he saw in his reply uh, something that indicated that he wanted to do this, but he was unable to do it. But, 
setting that all aside, he saw in this man's reply uh, an indication that he was not far from the kingdom of God. He was not far from becoming a Christian. And, you know, not far is, is not good enough. <laughs> I mean, when you stand before God and, and God says to you, why should I let you into your kingdom? You're not going to say, well, I'm not far. You're either, you're either in or out. And there was an indication from Jesus that this man... He wasn't far. He wasn't far from the kingdom of God. It was, um, it was, it was my privilege to be um, the football chaplain for the Spireites for 10 years. Um, and I saw them promoted from Division Two to Division One, But, but... Um, but once I left them, they went to the dogs. They went from the second division to the first division to the Vanarama or, or the conference lead. There should have been a, a rallying cry for Jim to come back, but there wasn't. So, but recently, recently they were they were in the uh, a playoff to go back into the football league. They were so close, but they didn't make it. And in all my ministry over the years, I have seen so many people that have been so close, but they didn't get in. They believed in God. They believed that Jesus died and rose again. They believed that they put their faith and trust in him. That would be it. But they didn't get in. I wonder if there's anybody like that here this morning. You're, you're not far from the kingdom of God, but yet you're not there. I, I find that challenging and, and searching. I, I, I want to finish with a, uh, just a little story about jo John Wesley. John Wesley, founder of Methodism. Uh, he, uh, in his diaries, he tells a story about in the 1700s, that he, he went to uh, Georgia in, in America to convert the Indians. And, and he, he wasn't very successful. And, and on his way back, uh, he wrote in his diary, I, I, I went to convert the Indians, but who will convert me? Because he, he said he was a Christian, but he had no real radical faith in Jesus Christ. And then he managed to find contact with uh, people who were in the evangelical stream of the church. And one day his eyes fell upon this verse of scripture that we're looking at now. You're not far from the kingdom of God. And that very day, he had an encounter with Jesus Christ where he was no longer not far from the kingdom of God, but he actually was in the kingdom of God of God. He met and had an encounter with Jesus Christ. I, I, want, to, I want to leave you with this thought again. Um, whether, you're a, whether you were a, a Beatles fan or, or not, I, I, I want to leave you with this challenge that for us as a church, all we need, all we need is love. A passionate love for our God and a love for people. Love God, love people. That's, Jesus says, on those two commandments hang all of the law and the prophets. It's getting warm, isn't it? And I'm sweating here as well. Let's just bow, let's just bow our heads and just pray that. Father, I just ask you that this will become uh, a reality in our lives The benchmark for us as Christians is to love God and to love people by the, the way that we love ourselves. Just hide your word deep within our hearts. Help us to realize that all we need is love. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Bless you.